A Present Day Challenge to Prayer by Dr. Carey. Chapter 12, being read by Peter John Parisis, also known as Brian Dean. The Spirit of Meekness, Triumphing Under Testings. Two incidents, which occurred when Mr. Hyde was in England, gave me great pain, but they did not appear to affect him in any way. And to watch him at that time made me realize how very Christ-like he was, and brought home many lessons to me. Hyde and myself were invited to join the Kenswick speakers and promoters in a two-day prayer meeting at the residence of the late Reverend Evan Hopkins. We were glad of the invitation and had two days of very precious fellowship with the Lord and the dear saints assembled, about forty or more. The time was spent in prayer. It was an ideal time of intercession. I could see that the burden of prayer had come upon Hyde, for his very countenance proved it. He was in his element, with so many experienced intercessors around him. But I saw that he longed that they should be led into a deeper, a still deeper life of intercession. He did not say so, for criticism was not in his line at all. I do not think that I ever heard him criticizing any persons, though he could vehemently denounce sin. It was by his prayers, when we were praying together, that I was led to realize this. Towards the middle of the second day, one or two spoke, and there was a kind of discussion over the question of a prayer room for Kensrick. And we were asked to state our experience of this in Indian conventions. I stated very briefly my thoughts on the subject. I wanted Hyde to have as much time as possible, for I felt that he would raise the question to a much higher level than the setting apart of a prayer room where continued prayer could be made. He began and spoke more slowly, if anything, than usual. I happened to be the only one that knew him and knew by his manner that he was heavily burdened with his message. He spoke very quietly for three or four minutes. Then one of the ladies present began to sing a popular hymn, and it was taken up by several others and the message was never delivered. Mr. Hyde just closed his eyes and prayed. I was afraid that his feelings would have been hurt, but there was not a word of resentment or even displeasure. How many of us would have borne it as he did? The burden weighed so heavily upon him that he was prostrated and had a violent headache and became so weak that he could not leave with the rest of us that evening. So he stayed on as the guest of Reverend Evan Hopkins, and he told me afterwards that he had such blessed fellowship with him. Not one word did he utter about the meeting, having sung him down, but spoke with love and tenderness of all. How many of us would have stood it in the same way? I am afraid I would have keenly felt it, even if I had not resented it. But Hyde's constant fellowship with Christ in prayer had made him impervious even to such subtle attacks of the evil one. A similar incident took place at the Presbytery in North Wales. Mr. Hyde had been speaking with great power at many of the churches belonging to the Presbytery, and many were the invitations that he had to be present at the following Presbytery and deliver a message to the ministers and elders. <coughs> he was not officially asked by the moderator, that the leaders of the church where the presbytery was held had pressed him to be present. Being a Presbyterian himself, he told me that he looked forward with joy to the gathering. It was at a great sacrifice that he attended. He had to leave very early in the morning and take a long railroad, railway journey so as to be in time. He was suffering, too, at the time from a severe headache and from the malady, uh, malady which carried him away in less than 12 months. The presbytery was a large one, for it was rumored that Hyde would be present. Word was sent up to the moderator and to the secretary more than once, but the meeting closed without even welcoming a brother Presbyterian minister, who had been a missionary for years, into their midst. A visitor is usually welcome, especially if his name be known. But Mr. Hyde sat out throughout the whole meeting. Being deaf, he could not hear and the proceedings being carried out in Welsh, he would not have understood had he been able to hear. 
His eyes were closed, and I knew he was praying for all present. When the meeting closed, and many rushed up to him to shake hands with him and to express their disappointment that he had not been asked to speak, he smiled on all and spoke quite cheerfully. And when I expressed my sorrow and my indignation to him, when we were alone, he gently rebuked me and said that the Lord knew everything, and it was not our place to criticize the Lord's people. Scores of times since then have I thought of him when the Lord's children were inclined to act unkindly towards me, or appeared to me to misunderstand my attitude willfully, and then compelled to check myself and not to criticize them, but to praise the Lord that he knew all, and to pray for the very friends that acted so. How often Mr. Hyde excused men who had been unkind to him. They do not understand, he said. I know they do not want to be unkind, he once replied, when he was urged to defend himself against a bitter and unjust attack. A friend even offered to write and to explain, but he quietly said, This is my cross which he wants me to take up and carry for him. What if we all had this spirit? Misunderstandings in mission stations, etc., would cease. How the work in many stations in India is marred and hindered by these trivial misunderstandings. The parties themselves grieve over this and wish it could be removed. How often the work of the Holy Spirit has been hindered and even stopped by petty jealousies. Someone feeling that he is not having the position he ought to have, or someone has, has passed an unkind remark or an uncharitable criticism about someone else. Oh, these petty quarrels, jealousies, and misunderstandings among the dear children of God. How can they be done away with? I think that Hyde's way is sure to succeed. Be much in prayer. Let any slight or even insult be an occasion to pray for the very persons that do these things. And praise God for the privilege of being permitted to bear these things. I think it is Madame Guillaume that used to say when she was insulted or persecuted, Thank you, Father. You saw I needed just this humbling. But we need a life of prayer to be able to do this. Not a spasmatic squirt, but a habit of prayer to live in communion with him. Shall we take this lesson from Hyde? But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the grace, not the cross, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20:24. 20, By none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20:24. 20, in the evening, God was pleased to help me in prayer, beyond what I have experienced for some time. Especially my soul was drawn out for the enlargement of Christ's kingdom and for the conversion of my poor people. And my soul relied upon God for the accomplishment of that great work. Oh, how sweet were the thoughts of death to me at this time. Oh, how I longed to be with Christ, to be employed in the glorious work of angels, and with an angel's freedom, vigor, and delight. And yet how willing was I to stay a while on earth, that I might do something, if the Lord please, for his interest in the world. My soul, my very soul, long for the ingathering of the poor heathens, and I cried to God for them, most willingly and heartily. I could not but cry. This was a sweet season, for I had some lively taste of heaven, and a tempter of mine suited in some measure to the employments and entertainments of it. My soul was grieved to leave the place, but my body was weak and worn out, and it was near nine o'clock. O the inward peace, composure, and God-like serenity of such a frame. Heaven must needs differ from this only in degree, not in kind. Lord, ever give me this bread of life. David Brennan.